This is the warning. This will be an Ask Me Anything where I answer your questions. The question is from Janice. And in summary, it's this. Why is Haiti an American responsibility? Why aren't other countries in the world stepping up? And Janice adds, she understands the issue. She lives in Florida. Well, Janice, there's not an easy answer other than the truth. And the truth is, the United States of America is the most powerful nation in world history. And what happens outside of our borders will affect us here at home. The chaos inside of Haiti will leave Haiti now, and it will come to Florida. We have a stake in stability in the hemisphere and all over the world. American leaders have always understood this, going all the way back to the beginning of the Republic with the Monroe Doctrine, for instance. There is a question of humanity at hand. And one of the things in our divided time that we forget to do is show each other grace, to be able to look at the opposition in politics and find decency and shared humanity. You may not know this, but the effort begun under the George W. Bush administration and followed on by the Obama administration, and even the Trump administration after that, PEPFAR, the President's Emergency Plan for AIDS Relief in Africa, has saved nearly 30 million human lives. Think of the genius that has been saved and will be saved for generations of writers, of painters, of scientists, of engineers. It's impossible to fully understand and comprehend what it means to save that many lives. It would be wonderful if Canada was able to meet its responsibilities but it cannot because it will not. And whether they do or not, it does not abrogate the fundamental moral responsibility of the United States to act, not unilaterally, not as a police force, but in the name of humanity, for the sake of humanity, in Haiti, the United States of America must act. It must lead or it will pay the heaviest price next to the Haitian people themselves. The question is about the State of the Union address and whether there are any rules imposed on members of Congress with regard to when they stand, when they sit, when they cheer, when they boo, if there are any policies, if you will, regarding decorum. And the answer is, there is not, unfortunately. The State of the Union is a special occasion because it is the gathering of the whole American government under the Capitol Dome, where the Democratic branches co-equal come together. The court is represented, the legislative branch, and the executive. The legislative branch the Article I branch of government invites the executive branch in the form of the office of the President of the United States to the Capitol to give an address on the State of the Union, which is constitutionally mandated, though its form is not. For much of the history, the State of the Union was delivered as a letter. The practice of delivering it as an address is a modern invention but it has become steeped in tradition. There are ceremonies in most democratic nations that preface the opening of their parliamentary bodies. Many times the head of state is represented and that head of state is a constitutional monarch. This is the case in the United Kingdom, in Norway, in Sweden, Denmark, and other countries. 
in the United States, the only time all the co-equal branches of government come together that the American people see is for this occasion. And when they stand and cheer, when the House Sergeant of Arms announces, ladies and gentlemen, the President of the United States of America, and a great war goes, it is for the continuity of the Republic that the elected representatives are cheering. It is for the continuity of the peaceful transition of power that they are cheering. It is for the preservation of the Union through tribulation, war, civil war, depression that they are cheering. It is a magnificent event that should evoke patriotic pride. It is a dignified occasion that has been sullied by the antics of this era's depraved members of Congress, going back to Joe Wilson, who a Republican from South Carolina, like Nancy Mace, like Lindsey Graham, like Tim Scott, was, well, drunk on the floor of the House when he shouted, you lie, at the President of the United States, opening this modern era of a total collapse of all dignity when the three branches of government come together. The stripping of dignity from our democracy, from our process, from our country, from our institutions is something that matters. Trump tries to pose that strength is dignity, that cruelty is dignity, but it's not. The restoration of dignity around our most solemn occasions and gatherings is something of the utmost importance when we ponder how to move beyond this wretched era. The question is around Liz Cheney and whether Liz Cheney might run as an independent candidate for president, whether there is a viable path for that independent candidacy and whether said independent candidacy would hurt or help Donald Trump in his quest to take power. Uh, the fact of the matter is, is there is no viable path for Liz Cheney to win the presidency as an independent candidate. And any, any effort to do so would splinter the anti-Trump coalition, which would benefit Trump and make it more likely, as opposed to less likely, that Trump would be elected to the presidency, which is the one thing that Liz Cheney has said all along that she would never do, that she would do anything to make sure that doesn't happen. So I doubt very much that she would run as an independent for the office and ensure that Trump, in fact, won the presidency. So it would be very damaging, which is why it's unlikely to impossible that it will happen. Thank you for listening to my political commentary. If you like what you heard today, please also consider subscribing to The Warning, a daily newsletter on Substack.